Hello, everybody, and we today are going to be reading Chapter 3 from the book Managing by the Numbers. So Chapter 3 is entitled The Income Statement. What the P and L tells you and what it leaves out. The second important financial report is called the Income Statement. It's also known as the Statement of Earnings, Statement of Operations, the Profit and Loss Statement, or just the P and L. It shows you whether your company was profitable, whether it made money, or whether it made money over a given period or span of time. Income statements are tremendously useful. They're also tremendously dangerous because they can be misleading. Looking only at your company's income statement, you can think that you have money to spend when you don't. And you know what I like to say about the spend, buy or use when you don't. So looking at your company's income statement, you can think that you have money to use when you don't. You can think that everything in your business is healthy when some parts are not healthy at all. To understand this danger, remember that most business transactions consist of two parts. First comes a promise and agreement. You agree to buy something from a vendor and you make a promise to pay. You agree to sell something to a customer and the customer promises to pay. Next comes the settlement, which is when the bills are paid and the cash actually changes hands. Virtually all businesses have these two part transactions. Even cash based businesses like stores and restaurants don't usually pay, pay their suppliers in cash. Strange as it, as it may sound, the income statement tracks only the promise and agreement of a part of a company's transaction. It is not about cash. It doesn't show the dollars in co coming in and out of your bank account. The number at the bottom of the income statement, net profit or profits after tax, is not your cash you can spend. You might be asking, if the income statement doesn't show me what I have to spend or use, what good is it? In fact, the income statement is indispensable to a business. The reason is that it answers an important question, a question that runs something like this. Let's take the value of all the goods or services we delivered during any given period of time, whether or not we have been paid for them yet. Then let's figure out as accurately as we can what it costs us to provide those goods or services, regardless of whether we actually wrote checks for those costs. Now, are we making money from our delivery of those goods or services? You can see that a good answer to this question would tell you a lot about how you're doing. Naturally, accountants have to come up with some very clever ways of calculating costs. They have to take into account all of a company's costs, including overhead and the cost of borrowing and everything else, not just obvious items like wages and materials. At, that, at the same time, they can't just look at the checkbook to see what was spent because that wouldn't give them an accurate picture. So if you're a business owner, here's how they create your income statement. First, when you provide goods or services to someone, either you get paid in cash or you count on being paid later after you send the customer a bill. In either case, you record a sale. Accountants add up all these sales for a given time period and list them as sales or revenue on the top line of the income statement. Next, they do their best to add up all the costs that are connected to those sales. For example, say you run a clothing store. If your store buys several gross of golf shirts in March and sells them during April, May, and June, accountants don't count all the costs in March and all the revenue in April, May, and June. They count the cost of each shirt against the revenue from that shirt in the month that the shirt is sold. So I'll read that once again. They count the cost of each shirt against the revenue from that shirt in the month that the shirt is sold. Makes sense. And if you deliver your goods in a truck, they figure out how much you originally spent for the truck and how long it can be reasonably expected to last. Then they allocate a part of the total cost to the period of time covered by the particular income statement, a little bit for March, for April, May, and so on. Maybe you're familiar with the word accrual as in the accrual method of counting. Most income statements are based on the principles of accrual. We'll explain the exceptions in the following paragraph. An accrual, 
base income statement shows sales over a given period of time, April say, and the costs associated with April sales without reference to whether any cash has actually changed hands. It shows the revenues and costs that you have accrued in that time span. The beauty of such a statement is that it matches costs and expenses with the sales that took place during the time span it covers, and thereby lets you see if those sales are in fact making money. Accountants refer to this as the matching principle. If you were just looking at cash in, cash out, you wouldn't be able to tell what went with that, what went with what. We have just said, what we have just said about income statements applies to all midsize and large companies. However, certain companies may choose to use something called a cash-based income statement. A cash-based income statement looks just like an accrual-based income statement, but it is compiled differently. Sales are recorded only when ca the cash is received. Costs are recorded when the checks are written. We don't recommend managing with a cash-based income statement, even if you are allowed to file your taxes on this basis. See below. Yes, it's simple. Yes, it does let you postpone paying taxes on profit from sales you haven't yet collected. But it doesn't show you whether your company's sales are really profitable. And it doesn't even give you a complete picture of the cash flowing into and out of your company's bank account because some inflows and outflows of cash, for example, repayment of principal on a loan, are not recorded on an income statement. Here's a quick summary of tax law as it relates to cash-based income statements. If a company has more than $5 million in sales or has, has inventory, it is required by the IRS to use an accrual-based income statement, IRS's income um, revenue service. For, oh, let's read that again. Hold on. <clears throat> um, uh, if a company has more than $5 million in sales or has inventory, it is required by the IRS to use an accrual-based income statement for tax reporting purposes. Other companies, that is, those with less than $5 million in sales and with no inventory, are allowed to report their taxes using cash-based income statements if they choose to do so initially. They may subsequently convert their tax returns from cash-based to accrual-based. Once they do, do that, however, they must stick to accrual. They're not allowed to convert back. If your accountant tells you that you are eligible to file a cash-based tax return and advises you to do so, we urge you to do what many other small business owners do. Use an accrual-based statement to manage your business. At year end, ask the accountant to convert it into a cash-based statement for tax purposes only. The conversion isn't hard to do, and it will provide the tax advantage without depriving you the information you get from an accrual-based statement. At any rate, if a balance sheet is like a snapshot, an income statement is more like a movie. It tells what happened during a given time span. Let's examine Soho's income statement for its first year of operation. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Soho, Soho Equipment, the first year. When Bill and Carolyn set up their own company and brought out Williams Equipment Incorporated, they were pretty excited. Bill's mother, a graphic designer, volunteered to develop a logo and then have stationary business card and the like printed. The couple organized friends and families on a couple of fall weekends for cleanup and painting at the storefront. To Bill and Carolyn, it seemed that most of their regular work time that first month was spent on the phone. Bill called the reps who handled the Williams equipment account for a dozen different manufacturers and put out initial feelers to some other vendors. Carolyn methodically went down Williams' customer list, calling everyone who had brought from the company in the past four years and, introduced, and introducing herself. Part of the every day, every day was devoted as it had been since the couple first got interested in the business to a crash car course in 
office equip in the office equipment industry. Both of the new owners were technologically savvy and knew a good deal about computers in particular. Still, they poured over catalogs, product literature, and trade magazines, educated themselves in the particulars of the business. They also sat down with the employees they had inherited from Williams Equipment and talked about their future. Kyle Williams had three employees, all of whom wanted to stay. Charlie, a likable but awkward young man who loved computers, seemed to be able to customize the system in less time than it took him to eat lunch. Donna, 30-something and recovering from a difficult marriage, seemed like nothing seemed to like nothing so much as working. Claire, in her 50s, had returned to salaried work after raising a family and now spent four hours a day in the office. Donna and Charlie drove vans and installed equipment, with Charlie doubling as computer technician and repair specialist. Claire managed the office, answered the phone, and dealt with walk-in customers. When the UPS truck arrived with a big delivery or when something else needed to be done, everyone helped out. Talking with the employees, Bill and Carolyn explained their vision for Soho Equipment. They emphasized the need for fast, high-quality service. They elaborated on what they saw as the possibilities for rapid growth. The company held opportunities for everybody, they said, if everyone pitched in and did whatever it took to keep customers happy. It was only the fourth day of operation when Carolyn came out of her office grinning. She had made her first sale. As she worked her way down the list of customers, she asked them if they needed anything right now. Bob Thomas, a sales rep for the regional air handling equipment manufacturer who worked out of his home, did need something. His computer was three years old. He had read about some of the deals you can get on new computers these days from the discount store, but he hadn't had the time to look at them in person. Besides, he didn't like the idea of hooking it up himself. Though his friends all boasted that their 12-year-olds could set up a computer, Bob's oldest child wasn't much help. He was only four. <laughs> Talking to Bob, Carolyn probed a little. Bob had some of the software from the company, had some software from the company he represented that wouldn't work on his old computer. Yes, Carolyn said. Soho could install that and get it up and running. What else did he use the computer for? She ticked off a list of uses and explained to Bob that Soho would install software for anything he needed. By the time she was through, she had she had sold not only a cu um, co that customized computer and some add-on software, but a new printer as well. And yes, Charlie would be out to install it the next install it the next day. As the first year wore on, sales mounted. Carolyn had a magic touch on the phone. Customers liked her and wanted to buy from her. Bill cut deals with vendors to make sure the company always had plenty of inventory. He also mounted a direct mail marketing campaign targeting some 2,000 prospects in the area. Charlie and Donna seemed to work all the time, and even Claire, the part-timer, was enthusiastic about the new business. Over time, the new earners learned some interesting facts about the industry, the industry they were in. One was obvious. They could never come close to complete, competing on price with the office discount houses, and Kyle William had been wrong to even think of himself in the same marketplace as the big chains. Soho equipment would never sell to soloists who needed rock bottom prices and who were willing to do the work involved in setting up their offices. On the other hand, the economy in that part of the country was booming. Many of Carolyn's prospective customers had more money than time, and they had no interest in shopping around for the best price on office equipment. On the contrary, they wanted something they wanted someone to come in, do the work, and get everything up and running. They weren't really concerned about how much it all would cost. If Soho could provide a full st full office setup, a customized computer, printer, high-tech telephone, fax, and all the necessary supplies. And if the system were all set up and ready to go, customers would pay top dollar. If they needed additional equipment such as scanners or copyists, copiers, so much the better. It took Bill and Carolyn a few months to realize this, but as they did, they slowly raised their prices. In January, Soho recorded its best month ever, just over eighty thousand dollars in sales. April topped the record, hitting eighty-five thousand. At the end of the fiscal year, the accountant they hired closed the books. A few days later, he presented Bill and Carolyn with their first year's income statement. Line items on the income statement, like balance sheets, income statements follow a more or less conventional format. So the income statement of the Soho equipment is set up pretty much like every company's income statement.
but pretty much does not mean exactly. For one thing, there's no such thing as a sacred glossary for income statements. The term we'll use here are among the most common, but many companies use different terminology. Then too, the categories themselves may vary just because types of business vary. What is use, a useful category for one business may not be useful to another. So I'm gonna just show you the income statement here. We've got sales, cost of goods sold, gross profit, depreciation, goodwill, amortization, marketing and selling expense, general administrative expense, operating income, interest and other expenses, profit before taxes, income taxes, net profit. And it says how to read an income statement. Like a balance sheet, income statements reflect a series of subtotaling opera operations. In the format we use, the subtotals are indicated by a gross profit. Next, depreciation, goodwill, amortization, and the lines immediately following are subtracted from the gross, can't read this, gross profit to yield operating income. Then interest and other expenses is subtract to yield profit before taxes, and income taxes is subtracted to yield net profit. Negative totals are indicated by parentheses. In the example above, Soho Equipment lost $17,000 in the first year, which shows up in the next, in the net profit of negative $17,000. Okay. Alrighty. You may want to get out your own company's income statement and see how it compares with Soho's equipment. The first line in any income statement is the top line is always sales or revenue. It's the dollar value of the goods or services that customers bought. Remember that on an accrual based statement, the sale doesn't have to be paid for it to count as a sale. On the other hand, you can't ordinarily record a sale the instant that the customer places an order. You actually have to provide the good or service. For very long running projects such as construction, revenue is sometimes recorded as the job reaches certain percentages of completion instead of being recorded all the way at the end of the job. That's a topic beyond the scope of this book. Anyway, Soho Equipment in its first year racked up $500,000 worth of sales. When they realized they had hit the half million mark, Bill and Carolyn popped the cork on a bottle of champagne. The next line for many companies is cost of goods sold or COGS. COGS represents the cost to the company of all the goods that were provided during the period covered by the income statement. It's much the same as sales, except that sales show the price the customer paid for the goods, while COGS shows the cost of those same goods to the company. What goes into the COGS? It depends on the business and on the accounting practices followed. In the manufacturing company, COGS includes the cost of materials that go into making a product, the cost of the direct labor actually involved in producing the product, and a portion of factory overhead or all the expenses involved in running the factory that aren't directly tied to a single product. Some companies refer to factory overhead as burden. Many manufacturers, for many manufacturers, COGS is the single most important number on the income statement because it is the biggest factor affecting profit. The same is true of some retailers and wholesalers for whom COGS may be more than 90% of gross revenues. In those industries, COGS generally include only the price of good acquired for the resale, plus usually freight in, that is any shipping costs associated with getting the goods in stock. Companies that don't deal in goods, of course, don't have COGS line. Some service companies do have a line labeled COS for cost of sales or cost of services, which represents the specific cost of providing services. For example, a seminar company might take all the costs associated with the particular seminar, the presenter's time and travel costs, the cost of the room, instructional materials, and so forth, and consider them as cost of service, or COS. A consultant company might calculate COS for a particular project by adding up the direct labor and materials, if any, related to the project. In any event, note an important fact, one that escapes a lot of people who don't have financial training. COGS is not the same thing as what you might have added to your inventory during 
the period in question. Go back to the golf shirt example. COGS for the second quarter is the cost of all those shirts you shipped during April, May, and June. It won't. It doesn't include the back to school outfits that you bought in June, but it won't be selling until August. That cost doesn't appear on the income statement until the goods are sold. Soho Equipment reg registered three hundred and fifty thousand dollars in COGS for the first year. This was the this was the cost of all the equipment Soho sold during the year. Next on the income statement comes gross profit, which is just sales minus COGS or COS. Now and then you'll hear someone refer to this as gross margin, but we think it's clearer if you call the dollar figure, figure gross profit. Gross margin is better defined as a ratio, gross profit divided by sales. By this terminology, Soho had a gross profit of $150,000 and a gross margin of 30%. Depreciation or depreciation and amortization is the next line on the income statement. This can get a little confusing too. As noted in the last chapters, companies buy many items that they expect to use for several, several years. Buildings and vehicles fall into this category. So does most machinery and much office equipment, including computer systems. Accountants depreciate these big ticket items, which is to say they apportion the cost over their estimated useful life. The expense taken in any given year is called depreciation. Thus, the florist who buys a delivery truck for $25,000 doesn't expense the total purchase in the year she brought the truck. Instead, her accountant will depreciate it over, say, five years, and the depreciation charge of $5,000 will show up in her annual income statement every year for five years. Eventually, of course, the truck or any asset may be depreciated to zero, even though it's still in use. You may also find the word amortization on your income statement. It's conceptually the same as depreciation, but applies to intangible assets such as goodwill. Here's another quirk of income statements. Nearly every company has depreciable assets of some sort, but depreciation isn't always a separate line item on the statement. Manufacturing companies must include most of their depreciation on COGS, cost of goods sold. A training company might include depreciation in its overhead expense line discussed below. None of this goes against accounting rules. However, we think that most companies should state depreciation separately. It helps you understand how the net book value of fixed assets on the balance sheets decreased. The new owners of Soho, for example, brought $100,000 worth of fixed assets when they acquired the business. In the first year, Bill and Carolyn's account, accountant had depreciated those assets by 10% or $10,000. The accountant has almost also amortized the goodwill acquired by Bill and Carolyn by $1,000. That represents a decision by the owners and their accountant to amortize the goodwill over 15 years, which is somewhat faster than requiring account. But required by the accounting rules. The next lines in an income statement often vary. Some companies have one big headline, marketing, selling, general and administrative expenses, or MSG&A. So that's marketing, selling, and general and administrative expenses. Other companies break out these expenses the way Soho Equipment does into marketing and, and selling expenses on one hand and general and administrative expenses on the other. There's no fixed rule. It depends on what makes the most sense for your business. Typically, selling costs include commissions to salespeople and may also include the cost of shipping goods to customers. Marketing, include, marketing costs include advertising, promotional programs, and so forth. General and administrative costs includes office rent, office expenses, salaries of office personnel, and many other items that are sometimes called non-manufacturing overhead or just overhead. How important are these that how important are the items that appeared under MSGNA? Just as terminology varies from one company to another, so does the importance of these items. For large, a large manufacturing business, most of the action will usually be in the CGOS line with the MSGNA's expense just a small fraction of the total cost. For a small service, MSGNA is likely to be much more substantial. For Soho, you can see the two lines come together to make MSGNA come to $155,000, 
or $5,000 more than the company's gross, gross profit. That's not unusual in a small startup situation like this one, but it's not something you'd like to see in most more, more mature businesses. Incidentally, note that the difference between COGS and MSGNA is not quite the same as the distinction you may have learned in school between fixed and variable costs. Fixed costs are those that don't vary in short term with the quantity of goods or services produced. For example, the cost of a building. Variable costs are those that do, such as the cost of materials in a product. CGOS is mostly variable and MSG and A is mostly fixed, but there are plenty of exceptions. For example, CGOS and manufacturing companies include depreciation on machinery, which is a fixed cost. And selling expenses, part of MSG and A, however, is broken out, usually includes sales commission, which are variable. The next line on Soho's equipment income statement is operating income, also called operating profit. You compute it by subtracting MSGNA expenses, depreciation, and amortization from gross profit. Operating income can be another important number as well. If you're the business owner, it shows how much you are making from actually running your own business, omitting any costs of financing and tax obligations you may occur. Soho's operating income for the first year is a negative number, negative $16,000. Interest and other expense covers all the expenses that don't come from daily operations. If you have loans, as Soho Equipment does, the interest you owe will show up here. Profit before taxes is just operating income minus interest and other expenses. For example, an example of other expense that would show up here is a loss or gain on the sale of a fixed asset, such as a piece of machinery. Since that is a presumably a one-time transaction, accountants call it a non-recurring item, it is handled separately on the income statement. Soho's equipment only entry in this category is for $1,000 for the interest owned on its loan from Kyle Williams. Income taxes, in your accountant's estimate of what you owe the government on the profit you have made in the period i'm sorry income taxes is your accountant's estimate of what you owe the government on the profit you have made in the period covered by the income statement since soho equipment made no profit in its first year it doesn't have to set anything aside for taxes and since this isn't a book about taxes we won't attempt to accurately calculate soho's taxes liabilities for the future years either Okay, good. Net profit or profit after tax is the famous bottom line. It shows whether the company is making money on its sales and how much. It's the measure of how much new wealth the company has created in a given period of time. This is a number that you really want to be positive and growing. Although Soho's equipment negative number on this line, negative 17,000, isn't so terrible given that it's Bill and Carolyn's first year. As noted above, many income statements use different terminology and show other items.